This is Off Planet Radio. Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer. Randy is with me tonight and we have a special guest. We'll get into that in just a moment. Um, before we get started tonight, um, you know, I have something that I've been wanting to mention for a little bit. I want to give a shout out to uh, Crow777. Um, and what he's been going through and talking about in regards to the censorship that a lot of people are experiencing on YouTube. Um, Crow had his channel taken down a few, uh, a few weeks ago. He was like on lockdown with that. And he you know, made the round doing some talks on other radio shows talking about what's been going on. He's calling it the modern day book burning. They have let him back into his channel, but he is no longer posting his shows there. He's just doing like little brief intro snippets. He's moved everything over to his website um, which is crow777radio.com. And um, I, people go, should go there and support him. And the reason I bring this up, uh, A, we, we, uh, you know, we've done a show with Crow before. We, we love his work. Um, we want people to support him. But he's been, oh, okay, our guest is here. The other, you know, he's, been, um, he's been, you know, speaking out about some things, you know, in a very clear and direct manner for a really long time. And he's paying the price for it. And this is a, uh, this is not going to stop. This is coming on, you know, kind of pretty hard and heavy. And I've been planning on saying something about that tonight anyway, when yesterday a good friend of the show, someone who's been a past guest, brought to my attention um, that something was going on with somebody else online who also has been speaking out in a very um, direct manner lately. And um, he just was able to come back in right now. And so here to tell us what's been going on with his channel uh, over the last four to five days is uh, Richie from Boston. Richie from Boston, brother, welcome to Off Planet Radio. What's going on? How you doing, man? Hey, Richie. Good to, good to talk to you. This is Randy Moggins. How are you? Good work, oh. good work you've been doing, man. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm pissing somebody off because they keep pulling my channel down. <laughs> I think it's because I had Matt Landman on. It must be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we actually, just got start we actually just got started because we didn't know when you'd be able to come back in, and I was just sort of... <laughs> going over for everybody what happened to Crow over the last month or so, and then how now you're starting to experience something. So can you, for our listeners who may not know, let, let people know what has happened to you in the last five days? Well, I've been on YouTube for a long time, and I've never seen this happen to anybody, including myself. They hit me. I showed up on the news because they said that I was harassing Vegas victims. And that's not the case at all. I just said, if you got shot in the head with an assault rifle, you wouldn't be sitting there with a full head of hair like Fabio. So, <laughs> right, that, right. so that, that ended up on the news. And then I started that We Do Not Consent campaign. And I basically called out David Keith from Harvard University directly. And then everybody else started doing it too. So I don't know which one it was, but suddenly and magically, I got a community guideline strike every single day for three days, and then they terminated my channel, and my subscribers were reeked out and started hitting up YouTube, and they gave me my channel back, except they gave me my channel back, and they gave me back, in eight minutes, they gave me seven copyright strikes, so my channel's basically just a lame duck sitting there. I can't, op I can't upload, I can't do anything on it, so I got a backup channel going right now. Yeah, you had like hundred. Like yeah, you had one hundred and forty-five or one hundred and fifty thousand subscribers, and they just turned that off like nothing. It, took, it must have taken you know years to build. You know, Richie, uh, the person who clued me into what was going on on your channel basically uh, sent to me a link to a video you mirrored called SIS Ex Employee, and then you know, and then the next video you made was uh, you basically coming out as a targeted individual. I actually think those videos are probably uh, the reason why, um, and th that this, what they're doing to you, is part of the targeting of you as an individual. They're gaslighting you. They're, you know, to basically take somebody's channel down and then give it back, but then give them, got, you know, give them all these strikes the moment they put it back and saying it's been restored in full, but you can't upload to it and whatever. You know what I mean? That's what it feels like to me. Um, you were speaking in a very 
uh, you've gotten to this place where you're, you're, you're no bullshit, man. I mean, not that you were bullshit before, but you're not afraid. You're just speaking your mind. You're coming out, telling your full truth. You know, you're tired of the fucking bullshit. And when somebody gets to that point, that's when they become, you know, a problem to the system. What do you think about that, brother? You there? Oh, you're on mute. Hold on. We can't hear you. There we go. Now you're on, oh, you're muted. There you go. Yeah, that's odd. I'm not used to this platform. Sorry about that. My no bad. No worries. Yeah, I forgot about that. I forgot all about that. So yeah, it's like I said, it's one of the three. It is what it is. They they targeted me for a while. They do it to everybody. They hit you with the electronic frequencies in the middle of the night. They get you freaking out. And I figured out a way around that. So uh, apparently this was their uh, this was their reply. It's tough to tell. It's tough to tell. You know, everything happened in one week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's tough to it's tough to put a finger on it, but whatever whatever it's just showing that you know these guys these guys aren't screwing around anymore 2017 for whatever reason you got harvard university coming out and saying geez we weren't spraying the sky but if we were it would probably look like exactly what we're going to do right now and, and here we are you know what i mean it's it, we boston looks like london it's gray every single day yet it never precipitates in any way whatsoever at all it's crazy we live in a crazy time and nobody notices it just yeah. a few assholes on the internet notice it, and that's it. So there's that. Yeah. All right. Well, we, we just wanted to kind of give you a chance, let people know where they can find you now, how they can support you. We'd love to have you back for a full show sometime yes, soon. Yes, absolutely. We do. Yeah, but we just wanted to get, you know, we want to help you rebuild your channel. We want our supporters to go over and uh, subscribe with you. Let people know where they can find you now. Uh, Richie from Boston, Richie from Boston too, and uh, Jailbreak Overlander. <laughs> all on YouTube. <laughs> that's great hey you gotta you gotta mix it up or they'll find you you know what i'm saying and i'm on yeah. youtube i'm on the funny thing is let me just throw this in real quick the funny thing is is they scrubbed me they if you typed in ri in a youtube search engine instantly richie from boston found dead would pop up that was an old one you know cern did that so that's that was easy they scrubbed me. I was gone. I had never seen such a thing. They weren't screwing around, and then it just came back up, so it's all good. And I have no clue who this guy is, so that's kind of weird. Which and guy? It, <laughs> this <fella> right here. <laughs> the top of the page. Right. All right, man. Well, thank you for coming on. We just wanted to let Anytime. you... Anytime. Anytime. Yeah, we'll be we'll be in touch. But we'll have you back in some time in the next few weeks for a full show. We'll get yeah. in. Right. Thanks for popping in, Richie. Good talking hey. to you, brother. Matt, hit me. Thank on you, Richie. Brother. Later, guys. I will, Richie. Right. Thanks. Thank Sorry you. to see you. You're going through all that. That's uh, all good. It's good. It is what it is. Later, guys. Later. Thank you, Richie. Later. All right. Richie from Boston there, and uh, you know there's a price that gets paid when you begin to step out. Our guest tonight knows that. Some of the mysteries kind of already gone because uh well we sort of leaked that out but we'll do the formal talk show host thing anyway uh with us tonight is uh chemtro activist and filmmaker matt land landman and uh matt's official bio which we think is tremendously good <laughs> matt grew up in the suburbs of washington dc where he studied business and received a bachelor's degree in marketing management from virginia tech in 2003 he located to California where he worked in the finance industry and studied film at California State University of Humboldt and earned a master's degree in business administration with a focus in strategic sustainability. After various careers in business and finance, he left the corporate world to be an organic farmer where he unknowingly had actually began his career as an activist working outdoors and dependent upon the elements Matt witnessed weather engineering in Northern California as the region suffered from an historic and a catastrophic drought. The realization that the weather was being manipulated via atmospheric aerosol dispersal changed Matt's life forever as he inevitably decided to devote his existence to exposing the hidden agenda in 2015. Since this commitment, Matt joined the first annual Global Chemtrail Summit in Vancouver, Canada, in May of 2016 and began, and, and then again in May of 2017. I really jumbled that, sorry. And in two, <laughs> nice, good, good professional talk show. Host it's a long bio. 
in, in, in June of two thousand, I'm getting through this. I'm going through it, damn it. In June of 2017, Matt released the groundbreaking documentary, Frank and Skies, and has been promoting the exposure of the film and working on the film's sequel. He will be hosting the third annual Global Chemtrail Summit in Tucson, Arizona, May 2018, which is a fitting location considering the public launch of solar geoengineering chemtrails yep. as a solution to global warming. Matt continues to inspire others to bring awareness to geoengineering where many feel scrutiny and transparency is needed. I'd say we need more than scrutiny and transparency. <laughs> the website of reference here is actualactivist.com. There's a couple others Matt will tell you about it. Uh, after all of that, stumbling over my tongue, Matt Landman, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Thank you so much for having me, and um, thanks for the, the lengthy. I thought we were going to shorten the bio before we got going. But <laughs> we didn't edit cool. on the fly. I decided to go with it anyway. <laughs> we, th no, we think I'm, it's a, we I'm think it's a good bio. We think it's a good bio, Matt. So we wanted Absolutely. to have it all, all its glory. <laughs> Yeah. Welcome, welcome, Matt. And Matt is also the um, the uh, manager of Burger King this evening. So <laughs> yes, he is. He's the night manager. <laughs> all right, there Matt. we go, folks. Sizzling so beef in the background for all you carnivores out there. Well, since we've got we we got your full uh, bio there, why don't you just kind of give us a little bit more detailed uh, about what what happened and why you kind of moved from the life you had into what you're doing now? Because you're, I mean, at this point, I'd say you're. You're the lead guy out there on the actually doing something uh, in the chemtrail movement right now. You're you're the guy. So how did you go in a few short years from the life before to what you're doing now? Um, and thanks for that compliment. I'm happy to be in the. It's an honor and a privilege to be in the position that I'm at to be able to to spread some truth to the much needed the world. Um, for me, yeah, I like to convey to people that I'm a normal guy. You know. Um, I didn't have, I wasn't, you know, privileged. I didn't come from a bunch of money or anything, you know. I, because a lot of people think, you know, oh, well, he must have had it so good that he can just drop everything he's doing. I really like to convey to people that I'm just like yourself, you know. I'm just like the, the viewers and everyone else that's out there. Anybody can become an activist. But what happened with me is, um, I had all these different walks of life, you know, I bounced around, I grew up in, in Northern Virginia, right outside of Washington, DC, traveled across the country to San Diego, LA first. I couldn't, I couldn't do the LA thing. I know you like it, Emily, but I don't know if you like it, but I know you're living there. Um, you must like it a little bit. It's but a I ended up in San... <laughs> so I ended up in San Diego and I worked so many different jobs. I spent a lot of time waiting tables. I worked in mortgages. I spent a lot of time trading stocks and working in the stock market. I worked in hospitality. I was the vice president of Xterra Wetsuits, this glo global wetsuit company, triathlon wetsuit company. You know, I've been management. I've been behind a cubicle. I've, I've done it all. You know, I've been a busboy. And, and um, at one point, after having graduated top of my class with a master's in business, and getting some film degree experience. Finally, I got some to study film, which is what I always wanted to do. I got another dream job in a cubicle, um, analyzing silver and gold markets. I uh, was a finance analyst for a silver and gold jewelry company that supplies silver and gold jewelry to Walmart and Nordstrom, big company, you know, but like, it's no dream job. I was just crunching numbers all day. So after a while there, I had an opportunity to get out of there and work for a nonprofit. I thought that, that would change my, um, you know, because I'm a passionate person. I have a soul, and I thought that I could, you know, find something that would feel good, you know. And that was still, I was still in the cubicle, and it still stuck. So I eventually got the opportunity to work on an organic farm. And after all this education and student loans and stuff, I worked on an organic farm, like shoveling hay and, and killing weeds and growing organic potatoes and squash, winter squash. And I learned so much. I learned more on that farm than, I mean, more practical stuff than I had with, after, you know, spending 50 grand on student loans. And what I learned is if you put a potato in the ground, it grows potatoes. I didn't know that. And I was, I was like 32 uh, years old. I didn't know that, which was really sad. And while I was out there working in Northern California in the Pacific Northwest, um, just off the, the coast where I was in these epic redwoods, or the farm wasn't, but the ecosystem is these epic redwoods, 2,000-year-old trees, and they're used to this 
traditional system. Every year they get this seasonal deluge. We get the rain up here. You guys don't get it down in Southern California, but every year we get this six months of rain and we were in this drought. The drought had been going on for five years and I was none the wiser that weather manipulation could even exist, but I was working in a farm. So you better believe I knew if it was going to rain or not because I was out there in the elements. And finally we were expecting this, this rainstorm. And I'm telling you the story of like how I really woke up to it, you know, and it was a gradual thing, but I, I witnessed something. I, um, it was October and we were growing pumpkins in our squash farm and we did a corn maze, pumpkin patch thing as well. Uh, Warren Creek Organic Farms is where I worked. And we were due a week long big rainstorm. Where we're at, it's called the mouth of the atmospheric river where the um, jet stream comes off the Pacific o Ocean traditionally, and it hits this, this Pacific Northwest area where it's, it's about from San Francisco to Seattle. This entire region usually gets a lot of rain, and it hasn't, it doesn't get it anymore. There was some change going on, and I was witnessing it where I was working on the farm. Well, anyways, we had 100% chance of rain. The, the amphibious creatures from underneath my house were coming out, waiting for this rain, and you could, you could tell everybody, really, everybody, everything, the nature, everything was expecting and anticipating the storm. We had 100% chance of rain for the next seven days. And as these black storm clouds came off the ocean, I witnessed what I perceived to be a statistically significant uptick in air traffic. And these planes came and they left those persistent linear cirrus cloud formations that I later learned can be referred to as geoengineering or chemtrails or contrails if you don't know what you're talking about because they last too long. But either way, I witnessed something and the storm came and it didn't drop any rain. Every day that we thought we'd get some rain, it didn't rain. And when the storm did break apart a little bit, there, were the, there was a grid pattern up there. Like they, were, they sprayed the whole time. And it didn't do anything to me. Yeah. In my mental um, cabinet, in my, you know, I've got a cabinet of like a, well, now it's like a freaking library of all this weather engineering crap in my head or whatnot in my head. But I shelved it in my brain. And later, I was talking to a friend about how much nonsense it is that nobody knows about 9-11, that the next generation, that they just, because they weren't there to watch the TV, they don't. They believe that the official story could be true and all this. And my friend on the East Coast, she said, yeah, you know, those people, I can kind of feel that story, but how can they deny chemtrails? It's in their face every day. And, I, and, and, and literally this changed my life and hopefully um, everyone else's life once I stopped this thing. And I said, what do you mean? What's that? Chemtrails. And he, you know, my buddy, on, this is just a normal conversation. This is how much you can make a difference. It's just by planting that seed and lighting that fire under your friend's butt to make them inspired and empowered enough to feel like that they can do something because this little thing changed my entire life. I started doing some research and seeing what my friend was talking about and I correlated it to what I was seeing on the farm and then I realized that I was actually witnessing it a lot, um, every time a large storm system came in off the ocean and we weren't getting our rain because they were manipulating those storms. So I researched, researched, researched and I found out 1916 this Professor Hatfield made it rain in San Diego by spraying a, a silver iodide concoction. Silver dust can make it rain because silver molecules are hydroscopic, they attract water molecules. Well, also you can do the opposite and dissipate rainstorms by spraying aluminum, aluminum, aluminum oxide to be exact. And what I was witnessing was the spraying of aluminum on these storm clouds so that they couldn't drop rain, you know? And people, come to find out, people have been witnessing it for some time. And as I dug and as I um, tried to bring this awareness to my peers, my family, my friends, you know, I learned that nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it. I'm in California. People are awake to the harms of GMO food, all this stuff. But nobody knew about chemtrails. So I said that I could make a movie that was better than the ones out there. And I started on that. And then I started getting people together and eventually... I devoted my day in, my day out, my entire life to it, and here I am. You're muted. Yep. Uh, Emily, you're muted. Yes, I got you. Sorry. Um, okay. We both got a chance to look at your documentary the last couple of days. I've heard you speak many times. Um, 
And the documentary was interesting because it was a little different than most of the others we'd seen in that you're not really talking, you're just basically compiling all the evidence, you know, that there is, that this has been going on for a really long time. And um, it was very interesting, it was very good. And um, there was a couple of things that stood out to um, me. And the thing that, the first one that stood out to me that you had a quote at one point from George Orwell saying that uh, the system will sell you the solution and the problem, right? The control system will sell you the solution and the problem. Isn't sort of one of the unique things about, maybe it's not that unique because it's happening in a few other areas right now, but one of the unique things about this whole thing with the chemtrails geoengineering thing is they're, they're not only are they selling you the solution and the problem, they're selling you the problem as the solution, right? And it's just it's sort of like, you know, they're basically, you know, they're, all of these environmental problems we have are being created by the spraying. And then they're turning around and saying, but we need to do the spraying because we have all these environmental problems. So, so it, 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 which is kind of even a bigger whammy than just selling a solution and selling a problem. I mean, the same could be said for some of the stuff going on with, you know, uh, a lot of these events in Homeland Security, right? They say we need Homeland Security because of the events, but the, they, these agencies go It's a classic time. setup. If you're going to tell a lie and sell it, you make it the biggest lie possible. Yeah. And that's what they've done. They've built, they've wrapped this whole thing around what they always do, which is crisis and panic. Then creating, creating problems that didn't exist. Anybody that goes back to the 1970s and the early ecology movement, which I was a part of, would remember at that time in the mid to late 70s, and there's a Rolling Stone magazine article, I've got to pull this out of archive, projecting the next ice age, because at that time, climatologists were predicting something that were actually, if weather was left to go to its own tempo right now, we probably would be trending towards colder. So we moved from that into a period where there was a lot of shifting around. But by 1992, you had the Rio summit under the UN, where um, it was uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, Al Gore, and a group of other people began to put together what became the climate change, global warring panic. And they basically then began to ramp this up coincident with some of the programs that the military was already incubating in the background, which is where Matt's film begins to pick up. And so the problem was never, they defined the problem on the fly and they back engineered the solutions to it using the existing technology that they were, oh, look at this, what we can do. Isn't this nice? We have all these toys and then you go, but, but wait a minute, you had these from as Matt's movie breaks out in the beginning of it, you take us through Project Cirrus, Project Cumulus, Project Skyfire, all of these military projects. Funny how they all have all these names that they want to give their projects, just like they do with the mind control projects, to wrap around problems that they view as necessary for social control and conditioning. So, Matt, last night I sat down, I had watched your film probably about six months ago. I sat down last night, I watched it again, I grabbed some notes. And one of the things that's distinctive about the film from the beginning is that you set a context and a background for this. You, you broke out some of the history of this. Explain a little bit about what you discovered as you went back and did the research for the early part of the film and the timeline that you mapped out, which runs roughly from 1947 up to uh, the mid-70s mid and actually even into the 90s. Thank you so much, Randy. And that um, what you said is so eloquent about the, um, the military industrial complex having this, these tools in their arsenal and then figuring out how to back engineer the problems that they want to shove down our throats. There's this meme that I posted that's it's juxtaposed two Time Magazine front pages. One is from the uh, early 80s, I believe, and one is from more modern day, like 20, 20 years later. And what it is, is one is telling us we're going into an ice age and we're going to be under a mile of ice. And one of them says we're going into a global warming catastrophe and the polar bears are all going to have no ice to live on, right? They couldn't sell that mile of ice thing because 
A, what are we going to do? We're going to be under a mile of ice. It didn't, it wasn't enough fear for us. We weren't scared enough. But then B, they realized that they had ionospheric heating Tesla tech. They can heat, superheat ionospheres. They can create heat waves, but they can't create cold as easy. So they flipped the script. And like you said, brought it full force with the tools that they had. So the progression of the movie was actually, um, you know, I don't know what the belief systems of everybody, all the listeners are, but it was, it was, it was pretty much d divine in nature. Um, I, was, I was losing my mind wanting to get the movie out because I thought I was making a movie about Kim Trails are real. Okay, Kim Trails are real was, was the whole premise of the film. And every time I saw any sort of manipulation of the sky, I just really wanted to get this thing out there because I was spinning my wheels, passing out flyers and even hosting these summits, you know, I want to get it out to as many people as possible, as fast as possible. But the, the delay, all these delays that I started running into, it ended up being completely perfect because as I was wrapping up, finishing the film, I was, they came out and said that they were going to block out the sun with chemtrails and they started giving us new cloud names and actually telling the world that chemtrails are real. I thought the movie was going to be chemtrails are real, you know? And so now I was able to shift the film into, um, hey, they're going to block out your son. Guess what? And they're telling you, you know? So now I'm not much of a, it's not a theory at all. You know, mm. there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no theory. It's actually bringing full front the modern day. And then the film, um, digging in those archives, I couldn't believe how lucky I we being able to put it all together and get the, chrono the chronology of it all to be able to show the people how we got to where we are because that's so important when people want to build their mental construct they want to know you can't just tell people that they control the weather and even throw some vietnam operation project popeye or whatever um, because they did flood the ho chi minh trail they did learn to control the weather and weather as a um, war weapon during Vietnam. But that's not enough. If you can walk people through the chronology of it all to get to modern day to the point where they're aerosolizing nanoparticles, nanoparticulate metallics, and they say they're going to reflect back the sun, and then they're doing it, and then they're showing us pictures of what it would look like, and then you look in your sky, and it's actually right there in front of your face. You know, it um it actually ended up being a blessing in disguise. Little did I, I mean, little did I know, rewind a year ago and you tell me that and I never would have believed it because I was stressing to get the movie out because obviously um, we're up against a lot. We're actually, at the, we're actually at the crossroads right now from my estimate and from what a lot of other people have said as well, that where we're at in the timeline is that the next two years are absolutely critical to get these messages out and get people to at least start to look up at the damn sky that they, they live under. And this is, you know, we talk about this a lot, but I can't say it enough. There is a type of mind control that has created this, this disconnect from our natural existence on this earth. And I was thinking about this, Matt, when you were talking about going out and being an organic farmer and how it reconnects of how, now, most people grow up, they don't know where food comes from, they don't know how to cultivate food, and how we've been programmed to disconnect from the natural processes well, of the earth. Also, a lot of people don't even know what actual real food is anymore. The things that people are consuming, you know, our great grandparents wouldn't have looked at as food. So, yeah. And no one, and, and what's one thing that's in, especially um, fascinating is our dwindling seed variety. Nobody knows that we even, that seed variety even exists. People think that there's one cucumber that, and little do they know there's all these other seeds out there that aren't being used and, and they're literally going to be completely, um, they're going to be lost. All of it's going to be lost. So Randy, going back to what you're talking about on the timeline, it is, this is the most critical juncture for humanity because they're normalizing it. They're norm they are aggressively normalizing it so that, that they can launch full-scale deployment of solar geoengineering. They're calling it a mountain to both. Okay, we're not need. Oh, hey, hey, we just- uh, We're getting a bit of Matt, a- Matt, you got lead. frozen up. I, well, you're breaking up. Hold on. Let's see if we can- yeah, Matt just froze up, of course, right? When he's Sorry got about that. Am I here? Yeah, you're here. You're still a little yeah. frozen and broken up. So why don't you, uh, let's, 
hold on a second. You're still frozen. Okay, now you're back. So why don't you go ahead and repeat what you just said because I thought it was important what you were about to say. Yeah, it was. Um, so through this normalization, they're actually going full steam ahead to what they are calling a Mount Pinatubo effect, which is full scale global deployment. Mount Pinatubo was a volcanic eruption in the Philippines that released so much sulfuric dust into the atmosphere that it decreased the temperature on Earth one and a half degrees Celsius. Okay, so or or so they claim. They claim the science scientists cl claim that there was a cooling trend on Earth because I mean, is, is it correlation? Is it causation? You know, way to really even know if it was correlated or not. Like Randy said, we're on a cooling already. So did the volcano? And it's blocking out the sun because some scientists think that a volcanic eruption in the Philippines a decade ago put sulfuric dust in the atmosphere to, to block out enough sun to cool the planet. This is all lost work. You know what I mean? Are you raising your hand, Randy? No. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so where we're at is the most critical juncture that we could possibly see because there's this media normalization campaign where across the board, all of the major publications, they are, are at the same time, and I'm talking about scientific study. Harvard, three days ago, Harvard came out with a study, okay, on the out, and it's a total mind game, okay? I'm not, I'm not going to cuss on any more shows anymore because I feel like I need to kind of be this presence of a person and I don't want to be judged and I'm you know, trying to spearhead this That's movement. That's fine. So I'm not cursing. But it's a mind, it's a mind F-U-C-K. It's a complete yeah. mind F-U-C-K, right? And what it is, <laughs> right, and I cuss a lot. So um, what it is, <laughs> is Harvard came out with this research study that says 10% of the world actually believes Kim Trump, okay? And then they said 20% believe that it could be possible. And then they go into all of the science behind the psychology of the mind of, a, of someone who would actually believe that Kim Trump is real, but 10% of people think they do. And then 30% believe that it's completely ridiculous and all this stuff. But what they're doing is creating this polarity and messing with people's minds. And like you said, people are in this mind control where the media is telling us that they're going to be blocking out the sun and Lo and behold, we were programmed when the Matrix came out. And so I come out and I'm doing this grassroots activism. I say, they're going to block out your son. And people with a smile on their face, they say, you know what I mean, like the Matrix? And, I'm, and I realized that this idea has been planted in the mental construct, socially engineered to normalize it decades ago. Okay, this Royal Society, the people who have patents on geoengineering, that, um, it's Bill Gates is globalists, including David W. Keith out of Harvard. They have the patents. And once they gain control and do the deployment, there will be no turning. Oh, we're still in 2017. In um, early May of 2017, this year, there was the anniversary of Mount St. Helens erupting. Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980 on, right, right. I want to say, May, May 16th. Um, so on the anniversary of Mount St. Helens erupting, there was a group that met in Chicago and their meeting was to plan the full scale deployment of solar geoengineering to launch what they're calling a Mount Pinatubo effect. So they met on the anniversary of the other volcano erupting, which if you dig into that, that might have been when they first were testing their harp with weaponry to actually make um, volcanic eruptions and seismic yep. activity. But either way, you know, I'm not going to go there right now. So they met in Chicago this last May, to set up the solar geoengineering governance regime. They're calling themselves a, reg a regime. It's a self-proclaimed geoengineering governance regime, a body of only 22 scientists who um, came together to decide how they were going to go about full-scale deployment, whether or not they should consider the public opinion at all. You know, they took into consideration all these different aspects and they got 22 papers from 22 um, people. Okay, they, they had an open call for papers. I hired a PhD. I put together my own paper and I actually, you, you mentioned the Rio summit. In that Rio summit, they talk about, because um, I did all this research on the human 
rights. We have the human right to a say in environmental decision making. Okay? We have a right to involvement in environmental decision making. And, and blocking out the sun is an environmental decision. So a, a small group of elitists setting up a regime to completely block out our sun, that violates those real, the real treaty from the real summit. You know, there's these different human rights and ethical dilemmas that are not being addressed whatsoever. So we've gone full circle. So I mean, like, I'm just trying to play catch up, you know, like I went from a place of being kind of behind the scenes, trying to wake up as many people as possible, trying to tell them that geoengineering is ongoing, right? And it exists. And, you know, it was under this, this veil of conspiracy theory. Well, now they are trying to put together the governance body and normalize and socially engineer the populace enough so that there won't be any upheaval when they go full-scale deployment and block out the sun every single day on into the future. And once they have this regime in place, and they have all this funding and, and drones and stuff blocking out your sun, you better believe we're not going to have any sunlight unless you pay big money and you're an elitist, unless you're a globalist, you know? So the, the farming, the agriculture, the only seeds that are going to grow are Monsanto's seeds that are bred to not have enough as much sunlight that are aluminum resistant genetics monsanto's bees monsanto bought bee logics so that they could withstand the aluminum toxicity and what have you because the bees are dying off the only things that are going to survive are monsanto so we're only going to have the only thing we're gonna have is a technical a technical recreation of nature we're going to have technological food programmed food programmed bees not you know nothing that even resembles any kind of organic life but just real quickly just back to this whole thing, the, one of the parts that I don't understand how people can't, aside from just getting people to acknowledge that these things exist, that the, like, the governments and these corporations and whatever, and these scientists that are telling us we have to do this because of you know, climate change and, and global warming and all these environmental catastrophes that can happen, like, they're, they're the ones who deployed these things from, your, you documented it well in your movies, but from back in the, you know, 70s, even earlier people were, were you know, talking about these kinds of programs. And the, this spraying, we haven't lived in a natural environment since at least then. So the people that created the environment we live in now are also now, you know, anointing themselves as the people who should make the decisions about solving the problem. And the, and the thing that they're proposing as the problem is the same thing that, that created the problem they say we have. This whole kind of circular logic, snake eating its tail kind of system is, is to me like that people not recognizing that is almost as disturbing or maybe more disturbing than people not recognizing that this is going on in the skies above. What do you well, think? When, when faced, well, what I think about it is, is it's our obligation and duty to reach a tipping point by waking up as many people as humanly possible because like, like you said, we're at this, this precipice, you know. Um, I was just talking to someone about this today. You know, I mean, every time I'm in any sort of social situation, I'm trying to bring the truth to the forefront. And you gotta talk to different people differently, but really we have to wake up as many people as possible. So if you have to um, spoon feed it to some people, whatever, everybody has their own way of waking up. So I was talking to a coworker about it all and explaining exactly what you said. And, and this, this story that I told actually really triggered something with her because it made a lot of sense. And I, I told her about this heat wave that I witnessed. And it's exactly like you said, there was, in my situation, I was working on a farm in Oregon last year and I witnessed, well, first off, the, the, the Weather Channel is owned by the same conglomerates that are doing the spraying. So they tell you, you know, what's gonna happen and then they make it happen. So. You know, there's a little, it's, it's funny how so circular that <laughs> is. Right. Like the tail wagging the dog. So we were expecting this heat wave and I'm looking at my phone. I'm living on this farm, living outside in a tent and we're expecting the temperatures to go up all night long. Okay. During the day it was 90 degrees, but at night it was going to go over a hundred. And then at the end of the day, I witnessed in a full on, you know, I like to call it a statistically significant uptick in air traffic. So there was the surge in air traffic. And then all of a sudden there was all these persistent linear cirrus cloud formations bellowing into a white haze. And then they rippled out it like they were being zapped by an ionosphere heater frequency, Tesla tech, you know, it's harp technology, whatever you want to call it. And then um, it seemed like they were trapping in the heat of the day and then superheating the atmosphere. And then the heat wave, there it is. And then the next day, same thing. 
um, spraying all day long though. And then the heat went up all day long. And then we got, it was even warmer at night. And then the day after that, the, the headline in the newspaper was global warming, record heat wave. You know, um, ideas are being, are being, um, there's these ideas of geoengineering, you know, maybe we could block our sun and slow it down. They, they make the exact problem that they say is what they're trying to fix, but they are, they are the problem. Now, people not seeing it, people are so programmed through the media, okay, there's, got, there's the film recently, Geostorm, okay? The Geostorm film, it's a conditioning tool yep. to have this, this reality that, that can't be real in people's heads. And when you walk, when you walk out of the theater, your temporary um, suspended disbelief is still suspended. You know, but you don't know because you've left the theater. You think that you've left that ten temporary suspension of disbelief in the theater, but you haven't because you click on the TV and you're being programmed with all this fear mongering, another hurricane, another shooting, you know, and you're right there. You're still in that same brainwave stance. So you look at the sky, you know, and you're still in the movie, but you don't know it. And, and you're still just uh, sitting in your seat, right? I don't know, I kind of trailed off. But either way, people are, people are brainwashed. You know, like the, if you look at all of the different media conglomerates and all the different publications and how they frame everything. And I like to use this quote that can wrap it up my, um, my little rant is people, you have the choice. The choice is yours. You can either take truth as the authority or authority as the truth. And a lot of people, they just want to take authority as the truth because they, maybe they don't want to think for themselves. Maybe they've been conditioned that way to not be able to, to learn discernment. Um, wait, my, my tangent just wants to finish with this thing. The fake news. Okay, when fake news came out, <laughs> I was trying to wrap my head around it. I was like, whoa, wait, what is going on here? You know, because I always try to take an outside perspective because I'll go on, I'll get really, I'm a Scorpio. I'll get emotional. I'll go on Facebook and I'll maybe make you know, some assumptions that aren't really, I'm representing the truth right now and I have to really be careful with what I, you know, say and whether or not it's fact-based and stuff. And like, you know, the, the, the fake news thing, it did kind of mess with my head for a minute because it's like, well, what's real and what's not? And, you know, do I trust this website and, and, and what, 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 and what have you? So when I do this grassroots activism and I go and I'm handing people, I've been handing out DVDs, you know, but I do hand out flyers to the next event or informational flyers talking about climatechangeagenda.com, Terry Lawton's site out of Ireland, amazing website, my website, actualactivist.com, Frankenskies, the movie.com, you know, I'm just handing out information, trying to just plant these seeds. Some people will be willing to do their own research and go and go there. I talk to people all the time, especially young kids, you know, and I size up everybody I talk to, but I try, I try to not be judgmental and just, even though the flyer might get thrown away, I'm just going to do it. The youth, you know what they say? They say on almost every topic, 9-11, vaccines, chemtrails, you know, if they've heard about it, but I, um, they say the same thing. They say, I've heard a lot of things about that. Okay. And then I started trying to dig deeper. Like how come everybody's saying the same freaking sentence you know because these people are all being put in this little box and they're not really willing to wake up because they've heard a lot of things and i asked well you know about 9 11 right you know that there was building number seven the third building that fell free fall speed and you know the bbc reporter she actually announced it 25 minutes early reading off her script you know and they're like yeah well i've looked into that and i've heard a lot of things there's a lot of different sides of the story and so what i've learned is the, the, peep, the kids, they want the truth, they do a little research, and then they're bombarded with information on both sides so much yeah. that they can't formulate an opinion for themselves. They can't build that mental construct because there's, there's too much, okay? And that's what fake news does. It dissolves people's ability to discern. So these kids that are looking up the 9-11, they weren't even teenagers on that day. They weren't watching TV. They weren't there, whatever. They look it up on the, online, and there's both sides of the story. You've got Metabunk is your first thing on Google, of course, debunking anything that could possibly ever be truth. And then you've got you know, both sides of the story. And who are you to know? <clears throat> and so that's what fake news did. Okay? And fake news was, was CIA completely obviously, in my opinion. And what happened after fake news is there was legislation passed saying that fake news needed to be combated with CIA-made 
right. programming fake news with fake news. Right. Right? So it's like the same we, thing. It's the same to, thing. Yeah, we need to yeah. combat fake news by making our own fake, news. Fake. <laughs> that's the fake, right? Which, which they and, were the ones already making the fake news to begin with anyway, so they've just right. done it again. They've pro right. proposed the problem as the solution. Yeah. Right. So mentally, like, and not everybody is able to step away from it. Like, I can't, I finally can, you know? And I really need to, like, cause I, I have to, like, put things in its perfect little shelf in my brain or I'll, I'm not sleeping, you know? So me analyzing that, that whole fake news thing erased people's ability to discern. You know, so now I've got people, especially young people, they'll reach out to me and they'll say, they'll say, hey, Matt, is this real? Is this real news? Is this real news? You know, and, and the first thing I say is, look at the freaking website. If it's, if it's like some random thing you've never even heard of, one of them was Eddie, E-D-D-I-E, -E, like the name Eddie.net. Eddie.net started coming out with all of this global warming BS, you know, it was like pictures of chemtrails. And it said, one day we may be able to save the planet with, and then it's like, we might spray diamonds, but diamonds are really expensive. And thinking about aluminum. And it's just like, first, you know, is Eddie.net, is that a trustworthy news site? But, but also all these other news sites aren't even trustworthy anyways. So it's like, how are we going to discern there? The Economist, the New York Times, they've all been bought. Washington Times, they're all under the same umbrella of, so it's like really of, of complete nonsense and BS now because they're all handed the same script it's actually in my film where the all the local news broadcasters they're all handed the same script to say the same thing to shape your mental construct right so that's the, therein lies the problem with the next generation is teaching discernment because for me i can look at the headline and i can skim you know i can skim through and i can tell you immediately what they're trying to push on you where what they're trying to spoon feed you you know i have friends that won't even let their kids watch tv you know at all because you know the kids their their brains are so influenceable that they're being subliminally i mean they're being subliminally subliminally flip programmed they're being manipulated all, the, all these different angles you know you, you just got to take the kids away from those devices and all that stuff but for the adults and for like these college kids and as i'm taking the movie on tour and i'm trying to convince people that chemtrails are real and <laughs> that they're gonna block out the sun i mean that's easier to tell people because that's what they're telling people they're gonna do so long story short, this discernment, you know, it's really going to be our biggest struggle to bring this truth to the next generation because we're one generation away from, well, first off, being, becoming robots and then we lose all of our discernment because they just put the memories in our brains. But secondly, um, just bringing that truth to the next generation will be completely lost forever. You know, as you were talking, we recognize the paradigm that this is social engineering that has taken place over a long time. We're now at the point where an entire generation has grown up, my kids, not remembering what skies look like before these begin. By my estimation, as an observer only, I estimate chemtrailing seriously began sometime around 1998 in the Clinton administration. That's when I began to notice it. By 2007, when I did a considerable amount of traveling around the country from Maine to, let's see, I went to Bonnaroo in Tennessee, I was in Oregon, I was in LA, I observed the skies in probably about 15 states and took pictures of them and realized that the chemtrailing and the conditions that were occurring in the upper atmosphere were consistent all over the country. I was stunned when I saw it in Oregon because I was literally 75 miles from a post office in the Siskiyou Mountains at the time, standing on a ridge where the only thing in the sky was a hawk and watching the planes come in and begin their run over where they would have been running out onto the Pacific coastline out of, out of Oregon, probably planes coming down, I don't know, out of Alaska. I don't know where they came from. But I began to realize at that point that this was a long-term program. It was well-organized, it was well-funded, and that it was an organized conspiracy, just as every other conspiracy that runs the cabal operations in this, this governmental system, this global system, because this is globalism. And then 
to juxtapose that to realizing that our skies no longer were actually blue, that our sun was no longer actually the yellow, reddish, warm hue that it was when I was a kid growing up and going, when did that change? When did that thing in the sky become phosphor phosphorescent orb? And I'm going, this is much deeper than just seeding clouds. There's something else going on. When you have dominance over the air, when you have total control of that domain, you are literally in control of the entire earth. Yeah. Um, I, I first recognized the, the chemtrails, um, I think it was in about 1997, and it's interesting, um, you're having your next summit in Tucson, Arizona, that's where I first recognized them. I was living in Tucson at the time, and I used to, sometimes on the weekend, I was coaching gymnastics, we'd have meets up in Phoenix, or sometimes I'd go up there to go shopping or whatever. I'd be, when I was driving back one day, I noticed that there was all these funny, it was like someone was playing tic-tac-toe in the sky. And when, we, when I was little, I used yep. to see skywriting. Remember skywriting? Yep. At first, I thought this was like somebody skywriting a tic-tac-toe board. And what's interesting was it was obviously coming from right there. Because I was, like, as I was approaching Tucson, when you're just about 20 or 30 miles outside of Tucson, there's Marana Air Force Base. And I noticed, oh, this is coming from there. I was like, oh, that's weird. And then I started to look for them. And I noticed it was happening all the time. So it couldn't be just skywriting tic-tac-toe in the sky all the time. And of course, I later found out that that's also in between uh, Tucson, uh, Phoenix and Tucson in Casa Grande, Arizona is where Evergreen is located. Evergreen's Evergreen. located, yep. Right. So it was, I found myself right in the, hot, the place right where this was all really emanating from and beginning from back then. And so I was aware of it from that point. But, you know, it, it has uh, obviously picked up and, and changed. And, you know, we're looking at a completely different kind of chemtrailed sky now in 2017 than the ones we were seeing 10 years ago. I mean, now the sky looks absolutely ridiculous now. I mean, you see all sorts of strange stuff up there. I mean, the kinds of, you know, patterns you see, you know, it isn't just the, the X, the, you know, the, the lines and the X's in the sky. Now there's all sorts of weird um, rippling kind of effects. You have all sorts of weird kind of um, cloaked, it looks like there's cloaking, like weird, you, there's things up there that look like animal shapes. There's, it, it just looks like ridiculous. And the fact that anybody would think that this is anything normal um, is crazy to me, which, speak, which takes us to the elephant in the room here, Matt. You were talking about how people are, you know, they've been socially, socially engineered, to, their minds have been constructed a certain way and they're not able to have discernment anymore. But what about the idea and I know you are, you know, certainly aware of some of this, that some of these things that they're spraying are actually used for mind control. Uh, you know what I mean? So the, not only are they not able to see what's there, but the thing that's there is actually what's causing them to not be able to see it. What do you think about that? That's a great question. Um, and I, I'm, I'd love to answer it. Don't let me get too off track. I definitely wanted to say that both of you all, um, having noticed the chemtrail pickup in the late uh, mid to late 90s 97 I think I heard both of you all say that's awesome um, you're veterans in this whole truth thing and that's super great um, in 1996 the US Air Force uh, released a paper owning the weather by 2025 and that 1996 paper um, details this atmospheric aerosol program <clears throat> um, when I first started doing my research I found um, that the search terms for chemtrails and geoengineering, I thought that those were going to be my bread and butter. And I get notified every single day through Google alerts if an article came out on geoengineering or chemtrails. Well, as I dug and looked in the bibliographies and of all these different articles and publications, I found that <coughs> hidden in plain sight are other terms. <coughs> okay, through NASA, there's the Charged Aerosol Release Experiment, CARE, C-A-R-E. <coughs> Excuse me. And through care, there's a complete program of spraying and planes and everything. NASA has a budget of $54 million a day. NASA was established by Nazi scientists, Operation Paperclip, uh, just after World War II. So along with the care program, there's SPICE, the uh, stratospheric particle injection for climate engineering. That's a program. SPICE, 
there's also the tropospheric aerosol program. And um, this tropospheric aerosol program was established hidden in plain sight. You can look this up, tropospheric aerosol program, T-A-P-D-O-E. And it, it talks about how the Department of Energy is completely involved in that. And I can talk about that whole um, Department of Energy connection in detail. It's actually a long tangent. But what happened was, is once I started digging and found this, this article, they lay it all out in this, um, this paper, Chobospheric Aerosol Program, Department of Energy, in the year 2000. So that's when they had already been spraying enough that they wanted to set up a budget. And in this document, you can find it, tapdoe.pdf. You can find it on, online really easy. And they grid the skies over Nashville, Tennessee. They test with these different balloons and drones, like where the plumes go and how the aluminum barium strontium mixes and all that stuff. And they set up their budget for the next year and everything. So you guys are spot on with that um, 1997 thing. I think that's when everything started really getting going. They were testing with different, the JP8 jet fuel and the additives. They were testing with a lot of different stuff, even back in the you know, 30s, like I show in my movie, the chronology of it all. So it, it, it did exist back then, but the, the significance of, all, of it all, when they really started doing it, was um, like really starting the entire program full steam. It seemed to be right, like around 96, 97. Um, also, you mentioned all the different clouds and how... Uh, like there's these insane looking ripple things and square clouds and yeah. and all of this nonsense because of the harp technology the ionosphere heaters the frequency manipulation all that stuff they had to come out with 12 new cloud names yeah. they had okay so the media is scrambling okay we're gonna we're gonna tell them that we need to block out the sun with these aerosol dish this aerosolized uh, nanoparticulate metals. Well, first, we're going to have to come up with some names for all these crazy clouds that we've been um, making before we come out with this agenda of the fake clouds, or they'll know that the fake clouds are fake, right? So they come out with the fake cloud names, 12 new clouds, and the news broadcaster showing them every single one is some chemtrail something or other, and they even have the homo, homo mutatus. Is like <laughs> homo mutatus, yeah. Yep. And it looks just like chemtrails. Um, there's a homogenitus. There, it's all it's all chemtrails and frequency manipulated. What they're over. basically calling it is man-made weather. They're telling you right there in the Latin roots of the whole thing, this is man-made weather. Or just like yeah. they tell you what the government is right in the word. <laughs> right. You know, the disassociative effect largely is to bombard people with seemingly true new information while not giving it a context. See, they always yeah. remove the context from the information. That's what fake news actually is. They can tell you a truth, but when they remove the context and the subtext, you don't have news anymore. You don't have, the, you don't have journalism. I hate the word news. And then people think that they're educated on a topic and, and they're not at all. They think that they know something. And when you bring the light to them of that topic, they think that they've already been there, done that, and have that knowledge that they don't need to hear it from you. And so, um, Emily, you talked about how the clouds and the mind control and the frequency manipulation is actually making it so people can't see it right in front of their faces. I've witnessed this. I've witnessed this. And what's especially daunting are the patents on using the ionosphere as a massive mind control yep. device and weapon. I witnessed this in, in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I lived up there. And see, the, <laughs> Vancouver is the, actually a capital for mind control. I learned that. Yeah. I learned that. And what's funny about my, my, my journey is um, I believe that I had this, I know that I have this destiny to, to bring, like I said, bring scrutiny and transparency to this and actually, you know, truth is a frequency, right? And it's not just about the chemtrails. It's bringing the truth to the, to the forefront for everyone. So it starts with chemtrails, but then once you're resonating on that frequency, you can, you can come to all these other truths. So it's really important. So in that light, my, in my life, I've been on this, this path to get on my, my journey. Like it's, it's, been, it's been a blessing and a curse. And over the past few years, all of these different things, um, I was prescribed a pharmaceutical that paralyzed me for a month for no reason. I took this um, ciprofloxacin, right? And I had to learn that the pharmaceutical industry is totally 
totally screwed up. You know, I learned it the hard way. I also moved to British Columbia in January and three feet away from my head and my bed was a smart meter. I had to learn the hard way about these smart meters and I'll tell you what, they're totally messed up. Okay. Um, same thing with a lot of things I've, I've learned through experience, you know, I mean, that smart meter was zapping me with crazy frequencies, and I thought I was under electromagnetic frequency attack. I was telling my friends that. I had a smart meter three feet from my head. I mean, these things, these microwave, the microwave technology with the smart meter is really bad um, and intense, and it really does affect you. So in that same light, I was living in Vancouver, Canada, and um, it's funny. I have this um, friend that's a similar truther, Nicole, and she somehow we're both water monkeys. We're both from the same, both born 1980. And um, that's the Chinese astrology, water monkeys. Yeah. And somehow we're always on the same page, right? So this one day when I was coming to this realization about this ionospheric mind control in Vancouver, Canada, she was sending me the patents on it, right? And so there is something in this truth community where you, when you, you know, your, your vibe attracts your tribe. It's really yeah. true. Like we really you're, in, you're, you're tuned in, you are beginning to operate in that empathic connective. So I was um, down in Portland for the global chemtrail summit, the second global chemtrail summit that I hosted. I'm hosting these global chemtrail summits to bring the activists together and give us a stage to be able to speak our truths, you know, which is really important. And, Scientists, meteorologists, all that, all those, you know, everyone who knows the truth and is credible is invited to come speak about geoengineering at these conferences. And the reason why it's in Tucson is they're launching the, this coming one in Tucson is they're launching geoengineering as the solution out of Tucson, Arizona. David sure. W. Keith has this strato cruiser plane uh, ship thing that he's going to fly up and spray the sky and be like, oh, look what I did. I blocked out the sun for you guys. You're welcome. And then, the, you know, launch it globally but um so that's why tucson's really an awake community and they need to know that that historically in the history books it's going to read that this program um, was first experimented and publicly approved and launched out of their city um so i'm i did the global chemtrail summit in portland and i went up to vancouver that that next day and i i could sense and feel this energy shift and the sky was completely zapped. I mean, the frequency ripples in the sky that day were, were almost unlike anything I've ever seen. I've seen some serious stuff in the sky now that I've drawn that to my attention and really started looking up. Um, but on this day in particular, you could, you could hear a needle drop in the city. I mean, I'm sitting in, this, in the downtown Vancouver, and I, it was palpable for me. I was thinking, like, why isn't anybody honking their horn? How is this whole city going on right now? And it was like silence. But the, the cloud layer was really low, and the ripples were, were really tight. And I started theorizing that the city was under some sort of frequency attack. And then I spoke with a um, close personal friend, author Ilana Freeland. She yep. wrote the book, uh, Harp, Chemtrails, the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet We've Earth. Had her got second We've had her here, yeah. She's amazing. And she spoke yeah. at both of my conferences and she said that at that exact time there was a um, war game scenario going on with Vancouver and the naval bases on the islands out there and they were doing an EMF, an, an electromagnetic frequency war game where they were literally attacking the city to see like I, what I envision is they, they, they turn on one frequency and, they, and the phones ring off the hook with these 911 calls and they do another frequency and it's silent, you know, and people yep. are just walking around like zombies. And I witnessed it. And then um, I get on my computer and, and Nicole, my water monkey friend, is sending me all the patents on what I'm witnessing, you know. So yep. it's real. It's, it's really, really real. And you try going up to people during that frequency day those zombies and tell them that, that the ripples in the sky are messing with their heads and that there's stem trails, there's no way you're going to get through to them. Um, not everybody. It's kind of like they're zombies and you got to hit them with a torch first and then tell them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's almost to the point where like I've heard people um, make reports from places where there's been events going on. Like I heard people talking about this when the whole thing at the Bundy Ranch happened. And I've heard of some of these things where protests have turned violent, that there was also unusual activity in the sky that day. So I does, you know, I am a hundred percent sure that they use it to make people docile or to make people aggravated and crazy. I wonder if they also do it to make people just to, so zoned out that what they think is happening is something different than what was actually happening. You know what I mean? And this is how maybe we're well, getting some of these crazy events that nobody seems to. You're dealing with, 
you're dealing not only with the psychological aspects, but the biological stressors that are occurring as a result of unnatural yep. systems. We are living in a fishbowl of electromagnetic fields now, coming from smart meters, cell phones, the grid. Um, 5G. You know, it's pick biased. one. But we're yeah. swimming in all of these frequencies, low frequency oscillations as well, you know, constantly working on us. So there's stressors because our bodies naturally resonate to the frequency of the earth, which is now disrupted, if not nearly almost destroyed at this point. And that's, that's where I was coming from when I said two years, because I honestly do think there's a point of no return with all this, both in terms of whether we can even reset the earth into a natural cycle. I'm, I'm of the opinion now, and Matt, feel free to disagree, natural weather is dead and that almost everything we're experiencing as weather is engineered. Um, I believe that everything is now engineered. Um, I've heard people say there's an activist Weather War 101, and yeah. I've got, I mean, I've got different activists all over the world, and I've heard people say that if they stopped controlling the weather, that it would just be a catastrophe, that it would stop and all this stuff. I don't buy that. I don't like that nonsense. That's probably what they say is an excuse to some of their people, yeah. why, you know, to convince them that they're doing a good thing. Um, if they stopped, the earth would do its thing and it would get back in. I mean, maybe maybe there would be a drought in the United States for a little bit once the systems got their act together. But there's a natural process. And, I mean, we all know. It would be like when a person comes off of drugs, right? Their body would have exactly, a really that's, reaction first. Right. And then they'd start to rest. And there's eat a boomerang rest. effect that you yeah. have to go around the back end of. Yeah. Yeah, I um, don't want to believe that either. And I do believe that because I believe the earth is something much deeper and spiritual and living, I give it credit for also being able to turn this thing around. But, you know, this really is dominance in a sense that historically I can't find any measure for except maybe in the tales of the ancient lure of the gods of this dominance of our, our, our natural our natural world. Yeah, it's, it's pretty daunting. And then, like you said, the different levels of frequency manipulation, it's to the degree where, I mean, what we are facing is so massive. There's a, there's a quote, I'm not going to be able to nail it exactly, but when faced with a conspiracy so large, people can't ex accept it, you know? It's so grandiose. It's too big. And <clears throat> it's just way, it's way too massive. There's, a, there's an activist... Um, he's from Alabama. He's living in Australia and now. He's just relocated to London. His name's Robert Deutsch, Deutsch, D E U T S C H. He shows these live feeds of the entire Earth systems and the currents and the jet streams. And when there is EMF, um, when they're aggressively manipulating it with these EMF waves, the EMF waves are the size of <clears throat> California, you know? There's, yeah. It's so massive what they're doing to steer weather patterns. And, and when there was this large earthquake in Christchurch in New Zealand, the massive EMFs that caused yeah. that, you know, it's just at such a massive scale that, yeah, we're, we're going into a, a very weird stage, dystopian future. There's um, Barry Trow Trower, I believe yeah. his name is. I'm looking to get him in my sequel. But what he says ultimately is this 5G and all these EMFs and all this stuff is that the, the, the fetuses now, that when these babies are born, they won't be able to have kids. Like this, there's gonna be a whole generation of people that cannot have babies because of this radiation that we're experiencing, the EMF. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that the 5G is particularly uh, like uh, disturbing and weird in a lot of ways. And the person who is uh, really adamant that we must have 5G now is almost as disturbing, is, is, is a match for uh, David Keith in the unhinged and disturbing department. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to bring that up really fast. Like I was watching those videos of David Keith in your movie. Yeah. Like this guy is, you know how they like to say that those of us who believe in chemtrails were like unhinged tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists. There, I've never seen anybody as completely batshit and unhinged as this guy is and the fact that anybody would listen to listen to this person and think that anything he says has any is in any way in touch with any kind of sanity is also very disturbing 
um, you know, that, that this guy is uh, looked at as a Harvard scientist and is looked at as an authority on anything uh, is crazy to me. Well, he's, he, all of his arguments are so circular. And if you look yeah. at any of his papers, he references himself in the bibliography of all of yep. his papers at that time. And then his cronies. He's, there's a very small group of globalists who have this agenda. And all they do is pat each other on the back. And these papers referencing themselves, circular referencing themselves. There's, an art, there's a paper out of um, Northwestern University in Chicago where this, um, like I said, they had the solar geoengineering governance regime established. I was out of Northwestern University in Chicago through Warren Buffett, another globalist. Of course. And um, there's a paper that came out of there a couple years ago. And it's, it's titled Geoengineering Patents. Um, and it, they claim, it's called, um, sorry, let me, let me find this in my brain. Um, geoengineering patents, um, something about, they have, it's called exclusive rights to saving the planet through geoengineering patents. They claim that they have, this is the name of the paper, exclusive rights to saving the planet through geoengineering patents. They claim that they, that their geoengineering patents don't have to go through, um, the natural process of laws because the law patent office can't understand their technology and that they have to issue their geoengineering patents immediately because they have the exclusive rights to saving the planet. And basically they're saying that no one can understand their technology and they have the technology to do so. So they have to have the exclusive rights and the obligation to save the planet immediately. It doesn't talk about how risky it is or that they haven't asked the entire planet or anything like that. It's, yeah, it's pretty circular and messed up. And it's just where in the hell are the lawyer activists in this whole thing that haven't taken a look at this and legally taken this apart? Because if they're violating the patent system, effectively, they've now gone outside of our acceptable system and created their own platforms. Well, so Randy, I ask myself that question all the time. Where are the lawyers, the people in the military? There's got to be some people in the military that know that this is a rogue, treasonous element that is trying to control the weather. So know? far only, so far only uh, uh, Kristen Megan is the only military yeah, person Kristen who's Megan. come out and said anything about it. But this sounds like some divine right to rule, like royalty kind of crap, right? Like, you know, we're, because of our bloodline, we have the right to rule over you because we, we, you know, we created this technology and you can't understand it. It's all circular. This is all like a circle jerk of self-contained flatulence that is unfortunately being, you know, rained down upon all of us, you know, people here. It's gross. Like, I just, I don't, yeah. And don't, let's not forget the concomitant with that is the fact that this is ultimately a business proposition. They're, they're very transparent about this. I mean, you know, you, in, in the film, you have the Senate hearings with Al Gore testifying and coming, you know, the whole thing coming out about the Goldman Sachs carbon trading uh, cartel that was set up um, that involved, of all companies, Enron, and Tim, and, and, and Tim Lay, and we've got this whole now burgeoning industry that's built around this, it produces nothing. But somehow they're justifying what I have to believe is still black budget expensing because Congress is, as far as I know, does not have on the books funding directly for these programs. Have you looked at that at all? How this is funded? Funded? Well, in a post 9-11 society, half of the military budget is, is black operations. You know, yeah. everything has gone into this shroud of secrecy, secrecy and national security where Congress signs these checks. They don't even know where the, where the money goes, which is, which is how they can get away with a lot of stuff like this. Um, what did you just say that I wanted to, to elaborate on? You really struck a chord with me. It'll, it'll come back to me in a second. Um, Oh, okay. I remember. So one thing that a lot of people don't know is the number one greenhouse gas on earth. Do y'all know the number one greenhouse gas by chance? It's water vapor. Did you know that one? So the number one greenhouse gas is water vapor. So if we're worried about greenhouse gases and global warming, then scrutiny and transparency needs to be brought to these water vapor trails that are, you know, causing clouds and, and literally heating up the, the, you know, the, the ground. Okay. For one. Now two, they've pitched this whole carbon as 
a demon thing so that we can have fear and feel like it's our fault. Our driving of cars are killing polar bears. Our driving of cars is going to cause levels to rise, that these island nations are going to be underwater and all this stuff. Okay. Now, this is such the big hoax. I mean, we all know, I mean, the viewers probably know, and you and I know that this is a massive hoax it's it's the biggest false flag that we've ever seen and the convincing of the world that carbon is the enemy when plants take carbon and you know it's not the carbon that's going to even do any problems the number one one greenhouse gas is vapor you know it's carbon is a drop in the bucket and it's not doing anything so with david keith he's got the patents through his royal society Royal Society, it includes Bill Gates and David Keith and a, and a few globalists. They have these carbon capture patents. So if the, and then if the world thinks that we can't reach our carbon um, uh, goals because Trump backed out of this the Paris Accord, Paris which Accord, is all, yeah. right. okay. So then you end up with these devices that are pulling carbon out of the air, maybe, okay. Well, yeah, who, who gets to, who gets to test that? Yeah, and who gets paid all day is David Keith in this Royal Society for pulling carbon, carbon sequestering. This technology and carbon taxing and all of this stuff and taxing everyone's carbon, eventually it turns into slavery of the entire planet because right. mm -hmm. everybody has to produce carbon to, to do anything. Well, also, we're, we are carbon-based life forms, so that is really the underlying language there, is that they're telling, they're telling us that, you know, you're, you're, you're the problem, right? They, they, you know, they look down, they look, you know, I don't know what they are, they're, you know, maybe they're not the same as us, they look down, they look down on humanity. Humanity and everything here is carbon-based life form. And so if the, if the life here is the problem, then the point is, is that that's what they're looking to do, is exterminate life. But this is, you know, when you begin to look and, there's gaps in my research, but I spent a lot of time vetting the materials that came out of the 92 Rio summit. There's a creepy speech, if you can find a transcript of it by Mikhail Gorbachev. It's one of the creepiest, uh, when I read it, I read it several times and I literally sat there and I had chills when I read it. Because what they have done is they have used this to justify the control of the entire population of the planet. And Gorbachev makes this statement in the midst of the speech at Rio, where he says, one may hope that they could uh, perhaps go away on a wave and hide, but they cannot because as a society, we are all in this together and we there, therefore must all cooperate with the initiatives that are being presented here at the summit. So what he was doing was he was using the collectivist narrative to create a global structure based on climate change and based on the solutions that were then going to be propounded as a result of what happened after the 92 summit. And when you read that speech, and I have looked for that speech online everywhere, somewhere I've got it printed, but I don't know where it's at because it's in storage, but I've looked for it online. I've, I've like typed in keyword searches and looked in, it's redacted. It's gone because it's that dangerous of a speech when it tells you, exactly what their strategies are for controlling the entire world under the umbrella of climate change. Yeah, well, isn't it, the, the, I was just thinking also that the um, term carbon sequestration may as well be code for sequestration of the humans, of mm -hmm. humans, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like, it, it, that's what they really mean. So they, whether, they might not actually be out there and capturing carbon, but they're just using this idea to ensnare all of the people in, you're absolutely right, we're gonna, you know, it's a, it's a global sort of mental prison that, um, you know, that it becomes more physical every day. But, you know, the, uh, yeah, the carbon sequestration is actually the sequestration of the human, of human species. That's what it is. Wow. So um, while I have you all, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, if you don't mind, the Department of Energy and how they play a role in all this, because it's, <laughs> yes, it's just... Uh, it's just now kind of coming full circle, um, exposing itself for me. So I talked a little bit about the tropospheric aerosol program and how the Department of Energy actually budgeted and helped launch this whole thing. Well, at my last conference in Portland, there was a gentleman who, who stood up and he wasn't the first that stood up at one of my um, conferences 
and spoke about these trains, okay? He had identified that these coal burning power plants had trains going straight from them to the US Air Force bases. And he said, all you have to do is follow the money. And, and what it was is these coal fire, these coal burning um, power plants, in their smokestacks, they filter the, co the coal as it burns. And so they have these nanoparticulate metallics that they pull from the soot. And then they're supposed to dispose of this hazardous waste and these bladders underground, you know. But what they do is they take it, they put it on trains, they take it right to the Air Force Base, and then they have their nanoparticulate nanoparticulate mm -hmm. aluminum, cadmium, barium, strontium, and then they can use that as, and aerosolize it and take it straight to the air. So he and other people had actually tracked the trains and tested stuff sloshing off the trains. And it was this coal fly ash, chock full of the exact same compositions that were coming down in the rainwater because people are testing rainwater when there's these heavy spray days, okay? So what you've got is you've got the coal power plants they are providing the materials instead of disposing of this toxic waste, you know, the same thing they do with the fluoride. They have the toxic waste. They figure out a way exactly. to get it into our bodies. You know, it's not the drinking water this time, but it's our air, but similar situation. Okay. So, so you think about it, the energy companies, coal and oil, they are figuring out a way to block out the sun, renewable energy. Well, that'll benefit them on into the future of humanity if they can erase that potentiality because we all know that the sun is our source energy and that we can get electricity from that and eventually burning coal, which is dirty, and burning oil, which is dirty, it'll eventually become an existent, you know? So if that wasn't enough, come to find out, these power plants have the ability to release these moisture plumes. Yeah. So if you think about it, the nuclear plants, they, they create um, nuclear reaction, and then they're pouring water on it and creating steam, and they have these turbines. They constantly well, put out steam from a nuclear plant. I they live... constantly are releasing these plumes, okay? Yeah. So they realize that every power plant can have the ability to release these moisture plumes, and they've actually integrated the moisture plumes into the weather manipulation yep. scenario, okay? so. Weather War 101, this, this activist who's anonymous, he actually, or he or she, brought it to the forefront and showed that Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Harvey went and hit Houston, but then it would circle back to the power plants that are <laughs> on the land. Go back to the power plants, yes. this magical, magical moisture plume would fuel Harvey and it would go back and flood Houston. Did this three times. So, so the Department of Energy is completely involved, not only in supplying, but in helping create these storms. It's, yep. it's, quite, it's quite fascinating. And actually, when you step away from it all, the entire agenda and how grandiose it is, it's, it's genius. It's, it's diabolical, it's evil, but it, it is actually genius at the same time. Yep. Um, speaking, speaking of, uh, I would keep thinking about um, Stranger Things and how in Stranger Things it's the Department yeah, of Energy that's that both too. running the mind control facility and deploying this, this, this weird uh, wow. fungus vine thing that has demonic entities living in inside of it that are capturing the whole town basically. And both, both programs are emanating from the Department of Energy, the mind control, and then this weird environmental uh, sort of tie in with like a you know entity kind of thing so maybe they're telling us more truth than just a you know a television show. but also the other thing that i wanted to hit on with you is all of the um the relationship of all of these geoengineering and spraying and particle kind of programs to exotic technologies exotic weapons technologies that are um being used against us in a way where some of these technologies could be used to help and, and solve some of these problems. You know, like the, some of the stuff that is, some of the uh, apparatus and planes and other craft in the sky that these things are emanating from are running on free energy technology, which is being denied to humanity. Do you know anything about that kind of stuff? Have, you, have, have your research taken you into any of that? Uh, well, not so much the free energy as much um because a lot of that is is hidden um but what is especially interesting to me is 
if you can make it rain, which they, in 1916, they learned they could make it rain. And that this technology has been perfected. They flooded the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, Project yeah. Popeye in Vietnam. When we're having these forest fires, there's not a mention, right. not a single mention on, by any of these news broadcasters or, or firemen or anybody, yeah. why don't we just make it rain over these fires? You know what I mean? For one. Um, so that didn't totally answer your question. Well, and, and well, also, well they went to the trouble of setting those fires in the first place, which right. looked strangely <laughs> like they were a direct result of directed, directed energy. energy. Some of these exotic weaponries that I'm talking about. The, um, oh, the right. So, go ahead. Well, let, me, let me go on with the exotic weaponry. But what, what I am learning, though, is as they spray these frequency embedded nanoparticulate metallics, it's completely correlated with the entire 5G AI program. Yep. It's correlated um, with the mind control, of course. The, the whole MK Ultra program is, is gone, has gone grandiose into this the 5G towers and everything is all intercorrelated. It's all connected, you know, even, even the smart meters link back to the chemtrails, even the vaccines go, mm -hmm. go, go full circle. And the, once they get this aluminum in our bodies through vaccination, the flu shots, through um, even deodorant and the aluminum in that, through our food and food. then the chemtrails and all that, we get the aluminum inside of our bodies. But then the next stage in the, the next part of that agenda is, is the Activate. fluoride. Yeah. Fluoride activates it. Fluoride yeah. will, take, will escort that aluminum past your blood-brain barrier, and then the aluminum and the fluoride have a chemical reaction in your brain, you get dementia and all that stuff. So all of the agendas are, are interconnected, and then you have the, the synthetic biology and, and the Morgellons and stuff, and that gets into the, um, the advanced weaponry and all that. But yeah. I think that... I think the more aluminum that builds up inside of us, inside of the trees, inside of the plants, the more receptive we are to this, this AI takeover and turning everybody into, you know, self-driving robots. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that, that, that we've been talking about and I've been looking into a lot lately also is this whole idea of certain foods as being programmable matter. So if you have, you know, certainly obviously with GMO, I've been looking into the concept of sugar as programmable matter. And I see that as being something that is activated by some of this 5G kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Um, basically you get enough stuff in the, bot in the body and then you just hit it with the frequencies and it's basically activating, you know, kind of a, an AI system within the body at that point. Well, yeah, and then there's this self-replicating carbon fiber nanotube technology. Yeah. And there's people reporting these, these webs falling from the sky. And I've got footage of these webs that have created a, what looks like a, um, a television screen, an actual screen. Is, I mean, there's terbium coming up in, these, in the rainwater after a heavy spray day. And terbium is a really ex highly expensive rare earth metal that's used in plasma televisions. You right. know? It's like, so then we go, well, are they really going to push this Project Bluebeam? Are they really right. going to do holographic technology in the sky? I couldn't help but, but be really curious when I saw the Santa Rosa and that there was directed energy being weaponry being used there to pulverize these homes. And I started thinking, are they testing their directed energy weapons so that when they do this, I don't even know what, fake alien invasion or what have you with the project Bluebeam that they can just destroy an entire city with this um scalar weaponry or whatever it is technology yeah. is that what that was you know because the blue beam thing it seems to be getting a lot more attention than it than it used to and then you've got Stephen Greer coming out with this fake alien invasion nonsense and all this whatever I don't really know where they're going I don't really like to just stir the pot with all the fear mongering or whatever but I do like to be on yeah in with the, you know I do like to be there but not spreading all of it if i don't have to they're definitely turning the sky they're definitely turning the sky into a movie screen i mean there are days when i look up and i can't it almost feels like you're inside a planetarium like you're at the griffith park observatory as opposed to actually being outside you know what i mean like it feels like you're in some sort of screened you know dome and sometimes the sky seems like it feels you know very metallic and it feels like it's very close like you could just reach out and touch a screen the sky is a lot closer now and on certain days when they're pulsing the atmosphere you not only can feel it but you can see how low 
the canopy is. I mean, I can sight it because I can drive across my region here at 900 feet above sea level, which is the level of the river bed, and gauge that relatively speaking to the cloud canopy which sits above us. I've got airports and everything else around us. They're pushing, they're pushing it down. At the same time, a lot of us, you know, this goes back to maybe three or four years ago, talking about being under a dome, a, a man-made dome, and how they are creating a dome effect on us. It's almost like a terrarium. Uh, yeah, very true. And, and that goes back to the ionospheric manipulation for massive mind control of an entire city. Once those patents, what it described, what I witnessed in Vancouver and what I read in the patents is once the atmosphere is lowered, then the frequencies can be pulsed and they bounce off of the ground and the lowered mm -hmm. ionosphere, which is metallic, and those waves, they, they travel and they hug the ground and they are right there where we are. We are all frequency. We have a resonant frequency. Our organs, our mm -hmm. brain, our heart, they all act in frequency. And even when we sleep and when we're in different moods, you know, our brainwave status can change. People don't realize how, I, I don't want to say people don't realize. I've come to the understanding that our minds are so susceptible to frequency. This binaural beats, you can put headphones in yeah. and just the different, your brain will calculate the differential. If you've got five hertz music over here and 12 hertz music over here, your brain will go to seven hertz and just adjust to right. the differential. Okay. If that is so simple with headphones, imagine with this advancement in psychotronic weaponry and frequency manipulation, what they can do to your brainwave patterns. They can put an entire city in an agitated state. They can also put them in a beta state where they're all in a meditation kind of trance kind of state. They can, it's, it's, it's quite staggering what the, the level of the advancements in the technology, and it's all spelled out in the patents. You know, yeah. when things are patented, it's not because that idea has come to the forefront, it's because they've made the technology, they don't want their, their um, enemies to, to steal it. They can put a whole city, I think, I think I read in one patent one, where they could put a whole city to sleep. I think I read that in a patent somewhere, that it had the ability to put an entire city to sleep. You know what I mean? <laughs> Apparently the whole that, world sleeps well. <laughs> that reminds yeah. me of the film Dark City, if you've seen Dark City. Oh, good. oh yeah, yeah, definitely <laughs> does. I so like you maybe we can flip this because we're kind of, we're bumping up against time, but we're not running okay. a strict clock and we will get through whatever we need to get through as far as, you know, what you want to say. Um, solution wise, obviously you've devoted your life to this and I don't mean just your time, but I mean your fortunes. Um, and I, I don't have a problem saying this. The listeners and the people, the viewers, the people that hear this need to know that Matt does this full time and he has literally put his life on the line to do this. And so needless to say, we support what Matt's doing and we hope that you'll support it too. In terms of your connecting and going out and talking face to face with people, which is a really important part of this, are you beginning to see acceptance of the message? Are you beginning to see the light switch on? Are we getting the aha moments when people finally begin to pull this together? Are you seeing that? Um, it depends on the, the demographic, the location that I'm at. I mean, if I'm in rural America, if I'm in the middle America, um, there's no convincing anyone, you know. Um, the country of Canada is pretty, pretty mind control, the, the entire country of Canada. Yeah. Um, but there are those pockets, you know. And it, it's funny because I'll go to a, an awake community where I think that people are going to be really receptive and, and they're not. They're completely um, programmed to the global warming hoax. They're completely programmed to, I say the word chemtrails, they scoff and they laugh because they think I'm gonna say a joke, you know? Because that word was coined by the CIA. The word conspiracy theory coined by the CIA. You know, like um, people have been targeted and their mental constructs have been formed. And, but yeah, to answer your question, I. I have, um, I've gone to farmer's markets in Northern California 
and every other person is not only knows what I'm talking about, but they're excited that I'm doing something about it, you know? So I've, it's, it's been, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a steady, a steady thing where, where, a, where you never really know. People are either going to be completely receptive or completely turned off. But I'll tell you what, I can look in people's eyes. And before they've said a word, I know how they're going to react to it. And um, the overall trend is that people are waking up because of the nonsense of it all. Okay. So I don't want to talk about the Vegas thing too much. They'll probably turn off the power at your freaking house if we do. I've witnessed that on these shows. Like they, they really don't like people talking about the Vegas thing. <laughs> no, no. For some We've reason. done enough of that already uh, anyway. But, but like as they elevate the, um, their audacity and the, the completeness of it all, it seems like people are having no choice but to wake up. You yeah. know, like anybody who knows that there's um, facial recognition software through, and thousands of cameras in every single casino, that like they have to think that, what do you mean you don't have a, a photo of that? When you witness a complete and total aerosol, aerosol attack, and then you see the news saying, hey, we've got a solution to global warming, we might be doing this, and they show you a photo of what you saw in your sky that day, you know, some people have no choice but to wake up. And I think that as that, um, it's like the hundredth monkey thing. Yeah. As we bring that truth to more people, the, the consciousness is evolving, you know? The ability for people to come into that light and be able to actually wake up is, it's rising. I think that we're getting there, it's slow, but it's, like I said, we have to just reach that tipping point and then it'll be just like GMOs. You know, there was a point when the GMOs weren't labeled, not at all. Nobody knew anything about them. People didn't even hardly know the name Monsanto. I remember hearing about it and um, I thought, oh, you mean like cherry tomatoes? You know, that's what everybody thinks. Oh, genetically modified, but that's not, it's, it's totally different. That's selective breeding, okay? What, what GMO food has done is create food that can be poisoned with glyphosate and stuff like that and not die and then we get those poisons inside of us, carcinogens. People risk their lives and some people died, but activists got loud and they got loud enough to reach a tipping point that now you go in the grocery store and it's literally labeled, you know, that's amazing. We're not there yet. We haven't gotten to that point with chemtrails, but we are well on our way. And I have no doubt that especially armed with my film, Franken Skies, armed with all of these blatant, obvious truths, like new cloud names that the, the truth movement is in its first inning, you know, and we're really, we're really going to see, we're going to see some massive awakening over the next couple of years. Yeah. We're going to see some attempt to block out the sun and gain full spectrum dominance of planet earth. We're also going to see a lot of people waking up really, really fast. And especially I have, I have no doubt that this tour that I'm going to take across the country, I'm going to be giving speeches. I'm going to be going to small towns, university towns, every major city in the United States. I'm hoping to attend and I'm going to be screening my film. I'm going to, you know, we're going to get to that tipping point. I have no doubt. Yeah. You know, I was really happy when I, I've been seeing you around for a couple of years, seeing the videos of you. And I was really happy when I first saw you because there's something a little bit different about you than there's been some great activists before you. There continues to be great activists. There, you have a unique quality, Matt. Like you're kind of, you're kind of an every guy. Like you're the kind of person that could be at just a party at someone's house, sitting around on the couch, having a beer with people and start talking about this in a very conversational way where people don't feel hit over the head, where they don't feel like it's being explained to them in terms that are so difficult to understand. You have a unique quality that I think is going to, more people are going to be open to than some of the, some of the people who we've heard from in the past. And, um, you know, I was, I, I was kind of excited when I, when you first kind of came on the scene because of that, I thought, okay, this is a person who can reach some people that weren't reachable before. And so. And you know, I like the fact that you yeah. do view this as a spiritual quest and I, I don't cloak that any other way. I think it's important to know what your calling in life is and you to not heap a lot of undue praise and make you blush and be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You know, we're very impressed with your transparency, your sincerity and, your sense of mission in doing what you're doing. You're getting ready 
and you probably are in it. Tell us where you are with Franken Skies too. Where's that project? It's um, in its infancy, um, but definitely it's gonna it's gonna be way better than Franken Skies one because Franken Skies I had no budget at all, and then when I tried to do a crowdfund and I launched the crowdfund for the film, promising people a copy of the DVD. Um, nobody was nobody really was impressed or willing to believe in me because i hadn't produced a movie yet and um, right. to my surprise once i put it up there for free once i put the movie up on youtube and vimeo and and everywhere for free and started going around on um, radio shows and telling people please watch my movie for free then people went to my gofundme.com slash frankenskies and started ordering the dvd for it was at first fifteen dollars. I put it on there for fifteen dollars, and then I went on the Richie Allen show, which is in the UK. Yeah, I got I got people ordering the DVD for fifteen bucks, but they were in like Johannesburg and New Zealand and all this. And then I found out that shipping DVDs over there is fifteen dollars. So, um, and that's without my the cost of the you know the actual DVD. So I had to raise it to thirty dollars, and I'm actually not losing money by shipping DVDs across the planet, but. I'm, I'm really excited to get it out there and it's been an evolution. So once I proved myself, then funding came burst for the, the camera gear and all that stuff, which, was, which is very awesome and rewarding, especially the fact that I now have a mailing list of people that care and people that have DVDs in their living room. And now I have, a, I have, their, I have your addresses, everyone, so I can send you know, the next movie and um, I'm, I'm gonna send some like stickers. And I mean, I'm, I'm planning on taking this actual activists into a whole new light. It's not just gonna be actualactivists.com and actual activists on Facebook. I want to create actual activists yeah. that, that make eye contact offline and really are empowered and educated to bring that light to the next generation. Actualactivist.com, I'm going to make into a not censored social media site where like-minded people can come together and bring those truths and, and not be censored and speak their mind and share that information in the website, which I, I did this website on my own, you know, and I'm not a web designer. A lot of the stuff that I do, it's just, I'm trying to do it all at once. And then I go back and I, and I'll fix it later. Like the film By the way, it's an ethic we actually embrace here. We're not qualified to do much of anything. We just do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and for Frank and Sky, the first film, um, I got to a point where I felt like it had to be put online immediately and it wasn't even done. I haven't, the, the, the score, the sound needs to be fixed a little bit. There's, there's little pieces. So I just called it the director's cut and got it out there and started promoting it. And then there will be uh, a cleaner version of it. And I am translating it into six languages. Um, and I can't wait to get it in Spanish. I'm going to have it dubbed in Spanish, um, not just subtitles. And the, the Spanish market, I'm learning Spanish and, and just wait until I'm out there giving speeches in Spanish because I really plan on inspiring um, the entire planet. Um, so the, the sequel, the sequel um, I have Ilana Freeland, who I didn't interview in the first one, who I'm going to be interviewing for that one, and Harold Krausvela in Berlin, who's deep into the synthetic biology, and really mm -hmm. just digging into the frequency and, and showing the manipulation of the mass consciousness and the MK Ultra and everything. This, the next film is, although it's in its infancy and I've only just now started filming, it's going to, um, I think I'll be able to get it out a lot faster because once, because I have this, this, this traction now and I have this network and I can get my hands on these, these people to interview a lot easier. You know, before it was a daunting task to even get in contact with Harold Krauss Vela in Berlin, but now we're buddies, you know what I mean? As, as this network grows, the ease at which it's gonna come is gonna be that much better. But what I felt like for the first film, Frankenskies, it was laying the groundwork, given the historical chronology to show us how we got to where we're at. The next film is going to go so deep into it that we're going to blow some people's minds. I mean, the bi synthetic biology of it all, like this is some really serious yeah. science fiction dystopian reality that we're being faced with. And ultimately, ultimately so I'm giving this presentation um, um, on 1111 coming up and I'm going to have this presentation online and it digs into all of it. Everything's been hijacked. Our food, our water, our technology, our frequency, our music, Tavistock Institute, Federal Reserve, our currency, everything's been hijacked, you know, and ultimately, and this presentation is going to be really 
uh, passionate, you know, I even have the definition of the word hijacked, like right in the middle of it after I've yelled the word hijacked about all these, you know, different topics. Our weather has been hijacked. Everything's been hijacked. Um, but ultimately, okay, the synthetic biology and our DNA has been hijacked. Our evolution has been hijacked. And ultimately, at the end of it all, it's an empowering thing. Because why? It's because this, there, there's these powers that want to limit our, yep. our abilities to thrive. Because we are co-creator, um, very powerful manifestors. We exactly. are spiritual beings having a human experience, not human beings having a spiritual experience. And once we come into our full truth and, and see how powerful really, we really are, especially with unity, there's no stopping us. And so all these things that feel like we're under attack and they feel like they're, they're dark things and that, you know, no, I, see, I see it. There's a positive side to it for from sure. From an outside perspective, oh, yeah. it seems like that it's kind of fear mongering. The, the first film I did end it with empowerment and, you know, giving people this, you know, inspiring, you know, we're going to do something about this. There are actually protests and don't, don't feel, you know, fear, or don't feel that you're helpless. The next film is really going to empower people with the ability to take the health into your own hands. The why are we under attack with synthetic biology to alter our DNA? It's because we're that freaking powerful that they have yep. to. You yep. know what I mean? So the ability to make something really inspiring and empowering is the goal. And there's and and to not leave people hanging. You know, I've learned so much about health. Um, through my own path and then talking to amazing people like yourself, I've learned so much that when people say, what can we do about it? I actually have an answer now, you know, that um, with mineral saturation and yep. taking your health into your own hands, you can um, fine tune your body. So you're not absorbing this radioactive barium and strontium and aluminum nanoparticulates. And, and by not getting the fluoride in your body, you're not, getting this aluminum escorted past your blood brain barrier to cause Alzheimer's and dementia and all these stuff. There's things that we can do yeah. through truth that a lot of people that don't know about it are, they're the victims. We're not, we're actually the bringers of the light, you know? Absolutely. I, it, it, were you taking ownership of your body through health? If, if people just did that, we'd be more than halfway there to all the problems on the outside as well. Like once you bring your body into an alignment with your highest, the frequency of your highest self and a lot of the other stuff starts to take care of itself. It's so true. Indeed. I think there's a probably pretty good place to leave it because we kind of parked that on a real positive node. Yeah. And Matt, can't thank you enough for coming by tonight, sitting down and sharing with us and uh, sharing the vision of what you're doing. Yeah. You know, we want to put this out hard and fast. We're going to fast track the video. We're going to push it. And uh, I, I got a sense that we're connected enough that this won't be the last time we have these conversations. And you'll be chatting us up when you're ready to put out Frankenskies 2, which I'm, I'm totally stoked for now after sitting down and watching Frankenskies last night. Can you remind people where they can find you before you go, Matt? Yes. Um, Please, if you want to email me or discuss any of this, send me pictures of your local 5G cell tower, send me pictures of um, the sky, you know, anything you want to talk about, I can be reached at frankenskies at gmail.com. Please reach out to me, frankenskies at gmail.com. Um, please share my movie um, or our movie with anybody and everyone that breathes air. It's on Vimeo.com. I think there's a slightly newer ver version on Vimeo.com. And we just heard about all the censorship on YouTube. So maybe we don't want to support YouTube as much. I went on YouTube and found every truth like minded person that had a large follower base. And I asked people to please, can you upload my video? Um, so I've got other people uploading the video, which is amazing. You know, it's like no ego. I don't even care about the hits. Let's just get this thing seen. Um, this one guy, latest technology, he put up Franken's guys. Um, he put it up under um, this movie is banned in almost every country. He didn't put the word Franken's guys on it. So he didn't have the censorship immediately through the AI bots because they're not that smart yet. And um, it got 100,000 views just like that. So wow. it's getting around. It's getting nice. around. And um, so please, on my YouTube, my YouTube channel is Matt Landman. Um, my Facebook channel, Matt Landman. Actualactivist.com. And please, Frankenskies the movie.com. You know, Frankenskies is kind of a word that 
I coined, you know, because a lot of people were really upset with the word chemtrails and geoengineering doesn't embrace all of it. There's so no, much, doesn't. so many other things that aren't geoengineering. And I feel like Franken skies is, is, is a nice word that we can share with people just like Franken food kind of brought this lightheartedness to it all. Frankenstein, Franken food, you really want to eat Franken food, you know, just in that light, there's Franken skies, you know, they're, they're Frankensteining our skies and it's pretty obvious. Um, so yeah, please reach out to me online and follow me on YouTube, Facebook, and check, take a look at actualactivists.com and check in, check back in because we will be revamping that site and turn it into a social media platform. But as it is right now on the top of the page, you've got chemtrails, vaccines, GMO, and fluoride. And if you click on those um, sub links in actualactivist.com, there's a plethora of information. There's even memes. So you click on chemtrails, there's a, there's a source for memes, vaccines, same thing. And there's all sorts of information. I guarantee there's something on there that most everyone doesn't know about. I mean, there's Dr. Emoto and Frequency and Dr. Sebi, GCMAF and Dr. Bradstreet. There's yeah. a lot of opportunities for learning and growth and truth that you can share with your friends and family. Before we go, I want to say one thing. I find it um, quite in poetic and, and just really kind of awesome. Your name, your name, Matt Landman, because you found your path and your destiny when you went to work on the land, man. Good job, man. <laughs> you know? It's true. It's so true. I love that. <laughs> M ties it together. All right. Uh, we're going to close out. I got one more thing I got to say. We just closed out the month of October on Patreon, and uh, that marks our first full month of taking on support, which this program tonight, you people who are on Patreon, you produce this. You are the producers. You are the people who are making this happen. You're going to let us launch out in ways that I think in the next year you're going to see an expansion and some improvements in, in things that we're doing and our ability to um, build a bigger platform. Thank you for that. Thank and you. thank you for those of you who will see this and be motivated to do the same. Um, everything we're trying to do right now is to bring truth and clarity and turn this spaceship Earth around before um, they rock it too far. That's going to close it out for this time. This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins with Emily Moyer and our guest, Matt Landman. Frankenskies, the film. Frankenskies, the movie. Go watch it. The truth is out there. It's inside of you. Good night. This is Off Planet Radio.